So I had a Twitter thread that went viral about this Revolutionary War log fort. So we discovered this old uh, fort inside an old house, an old plantation house here in West Virginia. And almost none of the original frontier Revolutionary War log forts survive, if any. But historians believe that there was this old log fort known as Burnside's Fort that was still there in Monroe County, West Virginia, within the walls of this large house. But here's the thing. We had to buy the property before being able to go out and take a crowbar to it to cut into the walls to see if they were inside. I was 90% sure that they were there. And it was there, and it was fantastic. This is what the place looked like then on the outside, and this is what the place ended up looking like afterwards on the outside. This is what the place looked like on the inside originally, and this is what it looks like now on the inside, where you can see the fort from the inside. Though on the outside, we left it looking still like the exterior of the original plantation house. During the process, I ended up excavating a few holes in the yard, and I found some stuff. Lots of stuff. And also, the inside of the house was absolutely full of an entire family's belongings going back to the mid-1800s. The entire inside of the house was full of interesting things that we found. I mean, we're talking shoes, dresses, antiques, hundreds of photos, you name it. This fort location is only a mile away from the town of Union, West Virginia, which is where my office is. Although being built in 1770, it's a full 30 years earlier than the creation of the town of Union itself. So it was situated on a strategic location on a rise at the confluence of two Indian trails right at the beginning of a major creek system called Indian Creek. There's the house up there on the, on the ridge. And down here is really the headwaters of Indian Creek. They call this the Burnside Branch. All spring fed, it's beautiful. It's a big spring coming out of the hill up here. It starts in a cave behind the house. That's why they chose to put the fort right where they did. The old original Indian trail ran from Covington up Dunlap Creek, up through Gap Mills into the headwaters of Indian Creek, and all the way down to the mouth of Indian Creek, so it probably came right through here. Probably one of the biggest reasons that they put this fort where they did was because up on the ridge, right behind the house, there is a cave, a large cave that you can almost walk into, you can crawl into. There's the back of the house up there. This is the cave spring. This spring feeds the house, or always has, and actually fed the dairy that was here for many years. Crystal clear, cold water coming out of there. Looks like an, a theme park, beginning of a theme park ride. Maybe I should get an inner tube. And all the way from back then, all the way through today, it is still the sole water source for this house. So you had a defensible location that also had its own water source. And before we bought it, a friend of mine, a metal detecting buddy, found a cut 1725 silver Spanish coin right at the mouth of this cave. So that was one of the large clues that this had to be the fort location and later confirmed by numerous other um, silver Spanish coins that we found. And people are surprised to learn that on these early 
Revolutionary War sites on the frontier, that was the ideal form of currency if you wanted to buy something from somebody else because it was a known quantity. It was, uh, there was a lot of Spanish silver floating around. So we closed on the property in April of 2019, literally 10 minutes later, drove out there and prepared to take a crowbar to the house. Here is some footage from that day. <laughs> it's a beautiful day here in Union and uh, this is from the top porch Looking out at Peters Mountain, there's the beginning of Indian Creek, Burnside Branch right there. So this is what the inside of the house looked like at the beginning, and then I'll show you the amazing transformation that occurred later. And this is uh, the second story of the uh, front porch. I've just gotten all the windows open up here. There's the original cherry banister. This is the 1810 section of the log cabin. Just pry it open all these old windows. Some big old floorboards there. And then this is the older section of the log cabin. So those hopefully are all intact logs back there. It's a big fireplace there. That should be all logs. Just got that window open. You can see the plaster over the logs. It's going to be fun. And the fireplace is covered over by tin. It's really the first bit of exposed plaster we have on the second story of the oldest portion of the log cabin. There should be logs behind that plaster. You can see there's several layers of old wallpaper here. And we just ripped off some of the uh, first bit of plaster of the second story of the 1770 uh, structure. Ripped off the old 1850s plaster and the furring strips and there is the first glimpse of the old uh, 1770 log fort blockhouse. You can see the hand hewn marks and you can see the uh, evidence of an old whitewash on the interior. This is the fancy kind of foyer that was put in the 1850s by Christopher Byrne, real wealthy guy, uh, leader of Byrne sharpshooters in the Civil War. Uh, really nice cherry banister that he had installed. Put in these beautiful floors over actually the original Fort floors, I believe, underneath. But this is the original downstairs of the fort I've been working on the past couple of days. You can see the original fireplace right there. You can see how the big beam is charred from fires from long ago. And this fancy mantle was put in, I presume, in the 1850s as well. I don't know exactly how we'll handle that, but. Anyways, this is all original log fort that I've exposed. Had uh, 1850s plaster over it. But you can see how all the chinking is all with stone, essentially making it bulletproof. A lot of the original chinking exists. You can see that's original. See how primitive it is, really kind of clay looking. And then some areas were rechinked like this. That was rechinked at some point. Knocked the hole in here just to make sure the logs were there. You never know what you get. Um, obviously, we weren't allowed to open the logs until we bought the place. Fortunately, the logs were there, so I was confident they would be. And so, this is all original fort. Everything on this side of the stairs, so it was a huge log uh, structure. I mean, the trees don't get much longer. 
This is the 1810 edition. You can see, you can tell that this is a later period log cabin. Shinking's like still perfect. By the way, I later realized that that was incorrect. Um, although historians did believe that the edition, the log edition was like 1810-ish, uh, it was later determined that it was probably at least 70, 1790s or perhaps earlier. And later when I got into that chinking, there, the older, older chinking was still inside. And so this is still a very, very early log cabin, even the addition. They had painted it at one point, and they had whitewashed it before that. There's an old math problem. Um, 46 plus 83 equals 129. That would have done, been done before the Civil War, because that was 1855 or earlier, we believe, the plaster. It's all cut nails. So somebody did that a long time ago and even wrote in the chinking. Some more right there. And so that means this is outside of the original fort. This would have been the west wall outside. You can see original chinking right there. It's very obvious. Ancient looking. And this even had a whitewash on it at some point. But look at the big rose head, hand wrought nails sticking out of this thing. And that's an indication of very early. Uh, construction generally 18 or uh, 1700s and uh, the rest of it is all put together with wood pegs uh, haven't opened much in this room yet there's a wonderful uh, huge bookcase probably made here on the property or in Monroe County West Virginia and there's another it's gonna be this is gonna be the nicest fireplace probably in the structure you can see the huge stone hearth floor. It even, even extends further than you can see. Um, just kind of knocking holes to see what we're dealing with. We notice there's the logs were taken out when they put this window in right there. I don't know about that corner section. So, But so far, I'm very, very happy with um, most, almost all the logs are there except for where there's windows. Uh, upstairs. And there's an entire addition onto this house, but right now I'm just working on the, the log. This is upstairs of the old fort. Gotten a lot cut out in here. Kind of see what the ceiling's going to look like in here. Beautiful attic floor. Uh, Nice beams. I've opened that up. Uh, there's a beautiful kind of stone arch in there. It's gonna be a nice fireplace. It looks like bricks, but it's not. It's cut stone. Really nice. Not much light up here. But you can see there was a window right there, just to cut out for a window. But they enclosed it when they made the house bigger. And found this, uh, I believe it's a shooting port right here. It's got a little lip right there, so probably had a, a block that sat in there and then you could pull it out only from the inside. Use it to see or shoot or as a window. Uh, Just some more of the logs, really perfect condition. Haven't found one rotten spot on any log because they continue to live in this house. They preserved it uh, perfectly within walls on both sides. Really couldn't ask for more. Found that shoe behind the plaster. Hey, Bobby. And this is the where the old fort, this would have been the southwest corner of the old fort. You can see where it joined together, really beautiful craftsmanship, all done by hand. And so this is the upstairs of the 1810 edition. And so it's really interesting, I uncovered this, you can see how they join the, the newer log section to the older log section. When they put this window in, Apparently wasn't there um, when they put the 1810 logs on because this is how they joined it. They put a log vertical 
and they hollowed it out, kind of like a canoe. And they perfectly hollowed it out using an aug hand auger. And then the logs would slide in perfectly. You can't really see, but there's logs down there and up here above and below the window. So you can see where they slid in perfectly to form this wall. And I would expect an identical one on that side. So again, here's the west side of the original fort right here. At some point they whitewashed it because it was an interior wall after they put the addition on. Again, you see huge rosehead nails sticking out of this thing. Probably take out those uh, modern closets right there because we're gonna expose all the logs in here. And this is gonna be a great room. It's, they still have, uh, they didn't lay the new flooring in the 1850s over it. So you still see what the old log cabin flooring would have looked like. It wasn't tongue and groove. They were just kind of sat, sat in there. Can't recall the name for it. But the chinking was all gone out of there and those were 200 years worth of bird nests I cleaned out. Uh, I've opened that up. That's gonna be a beautiful uh, fireplace and you can see they had another huge hearthstone in there. And I would, I fully expect there to be all uh, logs in here. And this should all be logs all the way across. But basically this is all a time capsule. I mean, there's 1937 newspapers just sitting there where they were last set down. We've gotten a lot out of here, but there's still a lot of stuff in here. And again, there's a whole addition on the house, which as big as uh, the house itself. And here's my favorite part about the house, is the view. As you can see, it sits up on a bluff and would have been really the perfect spot for a fort because you've got the creek down there, you've got a big spring down there, and then uh, behind the house, there's a cave spring. I mean, literally a cave you can walk into with a huge spring. Um, and it could have been within the fort stockade. So not only do you have a high position that's uh, very defensible, but you have your own water supply that could be within the fort. And it probably explains why it was never directly attacked. But this would have been the fort for the Union West Virginia area. The other closest fort would have been Cook's Fort in Greenville. And we know that the Virginia militia that were garrisoned here and garrisoned in Cook's Fort would range back and forth patrolling the frontier. I can't overstate what a pain it was removing the 1850s plaster. It was very difficult. Really, basically, there was no better way to do it than just with brute force and taking a crowbar and peeling it off the walls and the ceilings. And, and they used just hundreds and hundreds of nails like per square foot. I mean, it was crazy. And you just had to pry it off piece by piece. Some of it came off in sections. Some of it came off like in bits of dust. And then the best way I found to do it was to just put it in a trash can and pick up the heavy trash can, take it outside. And sometimes that meant down the steps first and then outside and then make a big pile. And then in hindsight, that wasn't a great idea because then I had to do something with that pile. But anyways, here is fast forwarding another couple months to June of 2019. You can see I had gotten a lot of work done. Along the way, we did a lot of excavation and metal detecting in the yard and came out with numerous finds from various periods all the way from really French Indian War era through the modern times. And remember, this property was continuously occupied from the time when we were still a British colony, circa 1770, all the way through the last occupant to live there in 2016, continuously. So there were items of absolutely every period please let me know if you have any idea what this might be it's grass and it's engraved you can see it was syndrilical that's a word someone said maybe a cane 
uh, decoration. I have no idea. It's brass and it's engraved. Um, I thought this was a part of a flintlock plate because I've found flintlock parts at this spot, but it seems to have an edge and it's way too thick on the top to have been a flintlock plate that I can tell. Maybe some kind of knife. It's it's uh, iron, I guess. Um, this thing I just found. It looks like a razor blade that had a handle that looked about like that on each end. This one got bent. Maybe some kind of small woodworking tool. And this, this is something. I just don't know what it is. If you know, please let me know. It looks to be, have been, had a uh, specific purpose, just like this. Maybe part of a horse bridle. This is all early stuff at this site. Check this out. I believe this is early 18th century uh, escutcheon off of furniture or a chest. Um, I found all these wedges. You can see where they'd... I've found four of them now. You can see where they'd been hammered on the top. And they all have a, an, an edge on the bottom. I'm not sure if they're for woodworking or blacksmith. This, I have no idea. Um, just found this. I think it's just a blacksmith forged really crude early hoe. Found it way down. I want to say like three feet down. Again, I've shown this before. I just have no idea what it is. But it was something. Um, I keep finding these old pewter spoon parts. This is, I believe, pewter spoon that melted. And here's a couple... Uh, surviving examples of 18th century uh, molded pewter spoons. This thing looks like a cobra. I don't know what it is. Someone out there knows. Again, we've talked about this before. Still can't have it figured out what that is. Same with this. I don't know if it was some kind of primitive fork. Maybe it was a longer fork that had a, you know, for a fireplace or something. Uh, what else here? Found a couple of these things. I believe they're pewter. They look like maybe a turn for a spigot. They were in the same hole. What else here? I believe I figured that this is a piece of a sear from a flintlock, probably a large musket, early musket flintlock. Could be wrong, but someone suggested that and I've compared some and I believe it is. This thing, I don't know. It looks like, almost like a, a cleaning rod, end of a cleaning rod for a gun, but it seems way too thick at the end. Of course, it could have been used just fine for a large, large bore musket. Uh, some kind of brush maybe I found the other day uh, there was a uh, chest locking mechanism old um, piece of a file made crooked knife still has a blade on it possible uh, Native American This is a pretty cool fork I found the other day. You can see where it was bent down on that end, bent down on that end, very early 18th century style fork. I found a bunch of them in this area so far. Uh, some great uh, ceramics I found. Just pulled those out a couple last week. I haven't shown these before. These are animal bones I've pulled out of holes. Trash pit holes, I guess. You can see where they, these are really old. I uh, found quite a few teeth. I'm not sure if those are, what those are from, whether they're hogs, um, cows, whatever. Um, it could be deer, exactly. I, I really don't know what I'm talking about. I found plenty of deer bones, and they do kind of look like this, but I really don't know. I found this the other day, and this is, almost looks like it has a screw on the end, but it doesn't look like it on the other side. 
obviously blacksmith made for some sort of specific purpose. Really don't know, maybe a hinge of some sort. Lots of great 18th century glass, hand blown glass, liquor bottle for a wooden case. Uh, really, really old horseshoes. If you want to know what old horseshoes look like, look how thin and worn. Barely have any kind of bump on the end. I don't know what the deal is with that. Maybe it's part of an ox shoe. I really don't know. And this, what is that? What are you? Anyways, that's probably as long as this video needs to be, but if you recognize anything, please let me know. Now, many of those items were subsequently identified, such as that thing that I thought was a fork, was actually a blacksmith made, like homemade 18th century drafting compass that was used in like charting distances on maps and also I believe like in woodwork and masonry. There are a lot of examples like that, that just through investigation and preservation work, I discovered what they actually are, sometimes revealing maker's marks, things of that nature. But it was a long process, and as all the, the COVID stuff happened, I had more time to work on figuring out how to preserve these things. So here's some of the stuff I've been working on lately. There is the uh, circa 1815, 1820, uh, still corked, probably whiskey jug, uh, found hidden in the basement of the fort. There's the uh, cut down Confederate boot, um, cavalry boot that was uh, probably up to here. Uh, and it was cut down and turned into a shoe that was found in the attic. Uh, some of the stirrups have been found in the yard. Um, there's a blacksmith made hoe that uh, I just finished last night. Man, it was in bad shape too, and it looks pretty good. A uh, piece of, uh, looks like a trade kettle of some sort, brass kettle. Um, there's the sad iron that was found in inside the fireplace between the rocks. Now that's an old one. I pulled this one out just to kind of show that's kind of a smaller uh, tailoring iron, also blacksmith made like 18th century style. Um, this is probably about like that. I'm guessing it had a handle sticking out of there. Uh, and let's see, piece of horse bit. This is a small trivet, I believe, that I found in the yard not that long ago. Uh, that took a while to fix. Uh, another uh, horse uh, bit harness deal. deal uh, scissors. Some of the buckles. Just finished those tiny little buckles last night. Um, some of the horse tack decorations. Uh, fork. Some of the old, real old uh, 18th century style horseshoes. And you'll see they don't have really the lip at the end. A bunch of lead that's been found in the yard. Um, let's see, a bunch of the knives here. These have all really come out really well. I mean, they love their knives, they love their forks, and they love their pewter spoons. But that's the scale, it's just sitting there. I believe it was from that knife. Just found it last weekend. And you can see I uncovered some of the maker's marks. You can see there's uh, William Greaves, well-known uh, Sheffield, England uh, uh, knife maker. And in fact, there's there's one, a William Greaves right there, just like that one. Um, it's a real old style 18th century knives there. They've got that ridge and then they come up and at the end they're real kind of thin and delicate. Just lots of different kinds out of uh, one location. It really is, is a lot. Um, found a similar number of forks and spoons. Here's some of the spoons. It's hard to see with the glare. Uh, pewter spoons. I've been working on the best way to restore these pewter spoons. Some great decorations. That's kind of how they look at best before. Sometimes they're in worse shape because pewter does not hold up well on the ground. That's how they look really originally. There's a really nice fork. Um, some architectural type stuff. 
I've, I can't remember call what that is. I figured it out at one point. I believe that it's maybe a door latch or something. Right there, that's a piece of a broken hinge. Some great big old uh, rose head nails, rot nails. A uh, pencil for a, for a hinge. Um, it would go with one of those. Um, there is the mechanism for a door. And I just saw the other day in one of Greg Shipley's posts that um, these traders out in Ohio, after their cabin burnt down, they grabbed all the hardware and they buried it in a cache to come back for it later. They never did, and he found it uh, not too long ago. So really, this stuff is not stuff they would throw away. And it kind of gets me thinking that a lot of this might be from the cabin that was burnt by the Shawnee in 1762, because you just wouldn't throw stuff like that away. It was reusable, especially the pewter as well. Um, let's see. And that's most of the stuff I've been working on lately. I've been looking for lots of contemporary versions of a lot of the stuff that we've found, like the forks. Um, got some of these for sale up in the shop already. Um, just like the Connect, um, kind of what they look like and before they went into the ground and what they look like now. Um, still lots to, to work on, lots of buttons and stuff that came out of there. Um, that thing was from a, a like leather wallet. It was like a latch. And we got tons of stuff still down there. Tons of stuff still down there that still need preservation work. Uh, I've got some some stuff over here. Some of the buttons, a lot of the dandy buttons that we found. Some uh, musket side plates. There's a first model brown bass side plate. Uh, some of the other stuff. And that thing, I don't know, I don't know what this is. Saw somebody selling one on eBay here last night as a Plains Indian uh, killing club, basically. And I, I also saw uh, one in the uh, in Dr. Hansen's fur trade book, just like this, as a killing stick for beaver trapping. And then a lot of people think that it might be, you know, for moving logs, a picaroon. And I think that's probably most likely. But some people have said it's a scythe uh, grip tang. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. It's pretty interesting. And this thing, I was thinking this was a broken sword or, or knife. But as I cleaned it up last night, you got these two holes in there. That's kind of bizarre. It looked like a tang and then a broken... It almost looks like a sword. I put it up to some swords. It's really more similar in size to a sword, like a blacksmith made sword than it is to like a big Bowie knife. But I, don't, I can't explain those two holes there. So half the fun here is figuring out kind of what this stuff is. This is really bizarre. Gosh, I don't know what that is. It's, I think it's copper, some sort of copper alloy disc, pretty thick. And it's got a hole in the center of it. So, you know, a lot of times we find on early sites lead discs with a hole, but, you know, I don't know about copper. Can't explain that one. Probably there's lots of different things it could be. Um, so that's some of the stuff we've been working on. Um, you know, the one good thing about uh, this all quarantine is we're able to process a lot of this work. And it's just as much work as it is finding it, pulling it out of the ground, uh, it's even more work preserving it all. Because once you get it out of the ground... I mean, it'll start to decay and deteriorate if you don't get on top of it. Look at all these things. Look at this big bag of bowls that were found in the yard. These are all man-made. And a lot of people think they're from the early settlers, not from the Native Americans. But they're little, like, marbles. Like, uh, made out of, made out of, uh, limestone and clay. I think mostly they're made out of stone. But anyways, uh, a lot of people think they're for, for games. Um, they almost look like some sort of natural deal, but when I Google them, they're commonly found on a lot of these early sites. Here's the upstairs of the old fort section. Most of the plaster are now down. Got 
nice ceiling. One missing floorboard from the attic. It's sitting up there. It just needs to be put back in. Two different size windows over the years. That one's obviously older on the right. That used to be the back wall of the house. You can see here's the progress in the newer log section upstairs bedroom. A lot more of the plaster down. Well, we figured out why the the plaster roof kind of slopes towards the front of the house. Evidently, they raised the roof on the north end. You can see where the original joists went in. At some point, they put another beam up there and raised the roof another 10 inches or so. You can see some original windows for when that was the exterior of the house before the addition went on. And there is the original outside have been the west wall of the fort. You can see there's no windows or doors. There you can see the how they joined the logs on the original fort. It's a very well done V-notch. And this is really interesting. This is how they put the log addition on in 1810. They took one big hewn log and they hollowed out the center with an auger and the new log walls, they made a special um, notch that would slide right into what they hollowed out. So it would fit right in there. And we had the same thing on the other side. You can see a later chinking right there, and there's the original chinking, that's what it looks like. Again, stone. Very nice fireplace over there. Really nothing to be done, just cleaned out. And that work on the interior just continued. As we went into fall of that year, um, we started to turn some attention to the outside of the place. Here you can see some drone footage of how it first appeared in September of 2019. I'm not sure when the last time it was painted was, but I don't think it was in, in anyone's recent memory. So the major thing that it really needed on the outside was just painting. And it ended up being a really, really difficult job to paint. It took a lot of paint. But the final product was fantastic. I mean, it went from looking like an old house that just needed a lot of work to just looking like this beautiful big house. The house is almost painted. Roof looks like it may be done. That little bit more there. So a lot of wood to paint. A lot of kitty cats. Hey buddies. Hey Bobby. Hey Bobby. Come here buddy. Come here.
and it was just very difficult to just get the place cleared out so that we could finish on the interior, finish on the logs. And a lot, much of the stuff we had to give away, though, we kept absolutely as much as we could. I mean, there was a lot of help from, you know, friends and people in the community, some people who came and took stuff, some people who came and helped at times. A long day at the Ford out here. Uh, we had some great people come by and, and really uh, probably did more work uh, than, than I did and I uh, really appreciate it. We really uh, put a dent in some of the uh, stuff that needs to come out of the house. And uh, really it's been great to have help because some of the stuff was so bulky. You can see that this, this room finally, this door hadn't even been open because it's been blocked. Almost uh, have this room clean. Just a little bit more. This room is already pretty clutter free. It just needs to be cleaned and, and chinked and we need to deal with the stonework. We really like to get rid of all these coffee mugs. If nobody wants coffee mugs, they're just gonna have to go in a trash bag. Oh, George, you're not supposed to be in here. Looking good. This is the room probably we got the most out of so we need to get the rest of the plaster out of here there's lots of furniture here that's gone now uh, this piano will stay back up against that wall the bookcase will stay and somebody needs to adopt this great art deco mid-century modern couch um, really it's a cool couch if anyone has a spot for it really it's the last big thing in this room um, that we need gone and then we can carefully get the rest of the plaster out of here and all the rooms will be plaster free this will be a nice log cabin room George you're not supposed to be in here and we have lots and lots of books not not the historic books and um, that belong to the family. We're, we're keeping all those, but just lots of novels, murder mysteries, um, probably romance novels. I don't know. Patterson novels, all sorts of stuff. And I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with all those if, if we don't give some away. Now there's more books up here. Yeah, look at all those books. It's hard to, it's hard to see with no light. Uh, that sewing machine cabinet. There's a Singer sewing machine in there that needs to go if anyone's interested in that. Um, that dresser, that table can go. Uh, we're keeping the rocking chairs. Those go on the second story porch. That desk can go. Um, that entire bookcase can go with all the books. Not a whole lot in here. This is pretty cleaned out. That chair can go, that baby bag can go, if anyone's interested in that. I don't think there's really anything left out here. It's a beautiful day today. 
Uh, those chairs are staying. Oh, yes, this is a perfect Christmas present for someone you really love. Um, we can wrap it for you. Um, they'll just love Christmas morning. Oh, man, that'd be so funny. Yeah, that was found in the attic. It's pretty crazy. I'm not sure for why I have it on the porch out here, but I like, it's one of the highlights I like to show people. Here's the fort this morning. It's looking good. It's just muddy, really muddy. It's really been wet. It's the Indian Creek down there really flowing. And there's Bobby. What's up, Bobby? How you doing, buddy? Yeah, loophole of some sort, spy hole. There was no window there. And this was a door, original entrance. There's where the palisade or stockade wall attached. You can see that it's been, it was bulletproofed originally with rocks for chinking. And that was a support, I presume, for the stockade wall. Upstairs. So we're in the last room of the house uh, to remove the plaster. As you can see, we still have quite a bit to do. We've got a lot of this wall off today. You can see where they had whitewashed it and lived with it, um, kind of pretending it wasn't a log cabin at one time. And the plaster was put on in 1858, so it must have been pretty early. You can see where they had written in the chinking. As we got more off, you could see different layers of chinking. Look at the white stuff in the front. And then as you get back, it's real dobby with rocks, clay and hair. And it tells me they didn't never removed the chinking, they just kept adding to it and adding to it. And you can see eventually their technology improved to where it was pretty much kind of a plaster type material. You see where there was a door here at one time. They put a vertical log there to fill the space when they Put a window in. Got all this removed. So what you're looking at now is the original, outside of the original, original fort. It's a 1858 newspaper that was used to plaster it. Several of them. Some more drawings in the whitewash. So this is all outside wall, would have been the uh, west facing wall of this blockhouse. Now, I don't know exactly which way the stockade went, whether it went behind us or in front of us, but this is pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, indi indicator right here. We found another loophole or spy hole or gun port, whatever you want to call it. And they've all been at about the same height. And I'm six foot four, six foot five, and I can reach my hand up there, but I can't quite see out of it without standing on something. So they would have done that. They would have had a platform inside. And so they would have been looking through this 
And I guess it's possible they could shoot through it as well if they were backed away from the wall somewhat and knew what they were shooting at. But so far, that's the only hole in this entire wall, except for the door, which was put in when this addition was added. That's the only hole I've found in the entire uh, two stories of logs here. And you can see, it's like uh, Goonies or something. I'm covering a part of the original fort that's never seen the light of day in who knows how long just covered with dust. You can see the old uh, northwest corner. You can see the saddle notching. Really um, great work with an ax on white oak logs. You can see how they attach the addition. And this is the first I've seen it where they've actually pegged this log and this is a solid log to the oldest part of the fort and they hollowed it out with augers and they made a little mortise and tendon type deal where it attaches. This got boogered up a little bit where they put this door in. Some of the big rotten nails sticking out of here. Some older chinking. So here's the inside of that wall. This way up. Nice day today. Candle tins found in the attic. Found this in the wall today. I think it's an old piece of a coverlet, I'm not sure. Looks hand woven. A few things that came out of the ground here. Bits of bones, buttons, some pottery. Somewhere here fired at found the uh, fired musket ball. Forgot where I set it down though. Oh, hey Bobby, what are you doing in there? You know you're not allowed in the house. What do you think, Bobby? Yeah. It's kind of a cold day out here. Hey, Bobby. Anyways, I'm just trying to finish this room off. The old fort room. Just been working on cleaning all the logs. Now I'm working on the ceiling, trying to get that old white uh, milk, milk paint, whitewash paint, whatever it is off. I've used various methods, brushes, um, now I found the best thing to work is, is just a very light sanding. Try to get that stuff off. So that's kind of what I've been doing to the beams. And it seems to be working pretty well. The hard part is what to do with those floors. You can see it looks like they had a brown paint on it at one time. And then they painted it white in several layers over that long before it was plastered. What do you think I ought to do with that? Whether I paint it white like your cabin? or uh, try to replicate that early brown paint, whatever it is on it. 
Uh, still have to figure out what to do with the fireplace there. Just been cleaning on the logs with several hundred years of dust in there. And I'm thinking I'm gonna try to save as much as the original chinking and stones as possible because it's just really part of the history. I know it's you gotta remove them to really do it right, but I don't have to necessarily do it right. It's just so cool how they bulletproofed it. I hate to, to even alter it at all where I don't have to. Same thing with the paint on there. It just looks like I need to start researching these early paints to see whether I should replicate it or try to preserve what's on it. Anyways, that's what I've been working on. The major reason that these logs were so well preserved was because early on, the owners of this property, obviously wealthy, could afford to put about inch thick weatherboarding on the outside. And they did, did that very early on. And it completely kept those logs dry and encased over the next couple hundred years, perfectly preserving them. And because there were some additions in the rear, there's a little room that you could now utilize to actually see some of the original exterior of the original fort slash log cabin. And that was really interesting because you're, you're looking at something that nobody's seen in a very long time. You can also see that they had the, the whole exterior painted white. This is the main room of the fort. See, that entire thing was a cooking fireplace originally. And then they made it to a more efficient, eco-friendly fireplace. See the original charring back from when they were pounding back whiskeys and eating venison in here. So I've been working on this little room, taking all this old siding off. See one of the old six over six windows. But check this out, original outside, one of the original outsides of the house when they put board and batten over the logs. And then they later, very early on, created this addition. But here, so this was the outside. So there are four under it are the, the logs of the original fort. So you can see the outside of the original 18th century fort for the first time in hundreds of years. There it is. That answers the question about whether the old timers whitewashed the outside of the log cabins. That is an 18th century log fort right there. And at some point, they had a whitewash on there. And it appears to have been, been way before they covered it with board and batten, which was early. So that must have been on pretty early. These are white oak logs. chinked it with stone to make it bulletproof. It's real old chinking, almost mud with hair, horse hair, all sorts of stuff in it. Again, that was board and batten that had trim that was taken off when the siding was put on. All right, here I am in the original section of Burnside's Fort in the west, well, northwest corner. And you can see this is the entryway. Originally, this was just all one big room and there was no stairs here, as you can tell by the missing joist. I'm just trying to get some of this cleaned up. You can see some of the log cleaning work I've been doing. Actually, I've been very happy with it. Since this was a, a f turned into a formal area at one time they would whitewash the logs long before they plastered it just to kind of make it look like it was plaster because uh, no one was really proud of having a log cabin and this was all whitewashed here it's come off pretty well uh, basically all i've done so far is just a little elbow grease with a steel steel wire brushes i did find uh this product called the wagner paint eater that actually works very well it's very conservative you can see it doesn't doesn't even take off the burning marks off the logs yet it takes off the old white whitewash paint and so I need to finish some of these other logs you can see I've done some on that one and I've just still been taking some of the nails 
from the old throwing strips that were in here out of the plaster. You can see that's what was over it. And that plaster still needs to come off the ceiling. So they would nail these little furring strips with these little square nails, thousands and thousands of them. And then that would be, they'd nail them directly into the logs and that would be the foundation for the plaster they'd lay on it. Then you can see that they put generations of wallpaper on top of that. So as soon as I get some more of these nails out, I'll start cleaning on some of these logs. I think it'll look really good. And at some point I got to tackle that roof. Roofs are always the worst part of taking out the plaster. And they even plastered over those beautiful tongue and roof early walls. So I gotta get all those out as well. I did it downstairs and it looked pretty well. It looked pretty good. Oh man, it's hot today. See, it works pretty well wearing down this head. It's, it's pretty soft, so it's definitely softer than steel. So it actually has made the order for these logs, but then where, the, where you see all those little cracks from the hewing marks, you still have to go back there with a wire brush and really scrub scrub in those little cracks because this doesn't really, sort of flat. It doesn't, doesn't really get into all the little nooks and crannies. But so far, I'm pretty happy with it. Just by itself, and then I've got this several types of steel brushes. This one attaches to a pole, just get some extra leverage on it. And it's kind of no easy way to do it. You just scrape it. It gets down in this cracks and gets pretty much the rest of it off. And there, now that wall looks a whole lot better. It still needs to be scrubbed some, especially that top one. So after we finally got everything out of the house, got everything as clean as we possibly could, then we had to eventually bring in a pressure washer inside and completely pressure wash all of the interior of this house where there are logs. Um, I didn't want to have to do that, but I didn't find any way around it because it was just a couple hundred years of grime and dust and, and there was no way of cleaning it and getting off the, the old generations of paint without just pressure washing it. So that's what we did. And it actually turned out really, really, really well. And then it came time to um, re-chink it. And so we kept the old chinking where we could because preservation was the number one goal. And then we had to experiment and by trial and error, come up with a way of making the new chinking to be installed and logistically how to do it. Okay, here we are at Burnside's Fort. Um, this early partition wall just got um, painted and to fill in all the holes with joint compound. Nice white paint over it, looking good. And we started on some of the rechinking. That was sort of our first test area right there. It needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Kind of see how we're doing this using a wire mesh and then we're leaving as much as we can where there is original chinking or original stones still in place we're just leaving them right where they are to just maintain the historical integrity as much as possible so it's not going to look as good as it as it as it was if we redid all the chinking but we're leaving as much in place as we can. So what we used here is basically a dyed concrete mix called uh, Flamingo C73, I believe is what it is. 
about three parts of of C73 and uh, or I'm sorry, three parts of sand of a particular color and to one part of C73, a little bit of water and turn, turning out perfectly. Thanks to YouTube. So this is the original fort section right here. This would be the uh, southeast corner. And got the primer coat on this partition wall as well. And as for right now, we're going to leave where the stockade wall attached to each side, just so it can be seen. Rainy day here today, Burnside's Fort. Well, I should say this evening. There, I just cleaned out the old bookcase. Hadn't been cleaned in a long time. All the books are getting ready to go back in it. And here's how the main level of the port is looking. Pretty good. And the upstairs uh, west bedroom. Still have to install the light in here. In the east upstairs bedroom, this is part of the original fort upstairs. See how they like to paint around the oil cloths, rugs, these walls. These partition walls are restored as well. Hours later, as they say on SpongeBob. 
So once it was done, and when I say done, I mean to the standard at which we wanted to bring it. And this was not to create a livable space or something that we would Airbnb. It was for primarily to preserve the structure and to be able to show it to people. It was more preservation minded. So once we, we finished um, to the point at which we wanted to get to, um, as I mentioned, historians believe that this fort was here. Well, the main one was Dr. Ron Ripley, and he is the local historian who had written the narrative for the entry, this house, this home's entry on the National Register of Historic Places. And it had a lot of fantastic information in it, including this belief that Burnside's Fort was inside this house. Well, once it was done, um, Dr. Ripley still being around, we arranged to have him brought to the house. And fortunately, we still had a wheelchair ramp at the house. And we, we got to bring him in the house and show him that he was right all along and show him the inside of the fort for the first time. And here you can see me showing it to him. The only real explanation for when I first uncovered these, I, I uncovered one side first, and I'm like, what the heck is that? And then I ended up covering, covering the other side. And I'm like, hmm, well, there couldn't have, there's no reason to run a log in here. There's no reason to run a log out there. Wouldn't have been for a porch or anything like that. Wouldn't have been for another structure at this level. The only thing I could think of, it had to be bracing for the stockade wall. You know, which is which is interesting because all my research has shown that there are, there's no original forts left, I, I believe, from the frontier log forts. And out of all the ones in Kentucky and West Virginia and Virginia, all of their basically just stains in the ground. Yeah. And so no one knew, I don't think anyone knew architecturally, they're always guessing on how they did the stockade walls, but I think this shows, in this case anyways, that's what they did, is they had a, a brace of just hewn logs going out from the wall of the structure, and then another brace up there. And then they, did, they didn't have a brace up top on that one, just the, the, the lower ones. And then you see up here, I believe this this was a, a spiral. spiral. I think it's too small really to shoot through. I guess you could, but it went. It was drilled all the way with a hand auger all the way through, mm -hmm. and we filled it in because we insulated it. But when I uncovered the plaster, that was that was open clear through to the yeah. other side of the log. So I believe that this window wouldn't have been here. This door was here, but then they had some sort of spy hole, probably with a platform to look through. So there's a spy hole on that wall. There's a spy hole about the same place on that wall. And then after that, I also got to give a presentation to the local uh, historical society, the Monroe County Historical Society, and that was a lot of fun. But as is always the problem with this place, I have so much time in it and so much, so much knowledge that I've learned, it's just information overload. And actually, if you check the the sort of impromptu Twitter thread that I did, it's actually very surprising how much information you can put into a Twitter thread. And that one just sort of kept going and going and going. So there's much more information and pictures there than I can really show you in, uh, in this format. Um, one of the things I've been asked several times is like, what is the your favorite thing that you found? You know, one of the best things um, that, that I think we found one of the coolest things is this huge blacksmith made key that was found again by my buddy Bill Burns. He found it in the yard maybe 20 feet away from the old Civil War era smokehouse. And he restored it with electrolysis and he gave it to me as he donated a bunch of stuff that he found personally on the property. And so he played a big part in this. And so when he gave it to me, I went out and went to stick it in the smokehouse door and it was a perfect fit. And that was it. And when I had a architectural expert come out and look at the property, he immediately saw this door and he says, this is way older than the smokehouse. This is an early 18th century door. And he believed it was off of the original fort and it was cut down much smaller to fill in the smokehouse. So that very well may be a door off the fort and the key to it. And that's why it's so big. But anyways, the other thing that we could ask is, all right, well, are you living in the place? No, no, we're not living it. What are you going to do with it? I have no idea. Um, it's sort of like the end of Finding Nemo where he finally jumps into the ocean, but he's stuck in the plastic bag and he's floating and he's like, all right, so now what? Well, we'll see.